Let's now move on to one of the other biggies in sonnet writing, Edmund Spencer. And this is Spencer's Sonnet 75, just in case you can figure out those Roman numerals. Edmund Spencer often has his own kind of rhyme scheme, and that's called a Spencerian sonnet. So I want you to read this and tell me what kind of rhyme scheme it is. I'm going to pause and let you figure it out while you read the poem. One hint, though, Spencer was a fan of using three quatrains in a couplet, the normal English sonnet, but not like Shakespeare did. Okay, that might have tripped you up a bit, but he overlaps his rhyme. It's A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. To be honest, I think he was being a show off. Okay, now let's read this. As a heads up, you've read your vocabulary and you know that the word strand means beach. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. What's he saying? Yeah, he wrote her name on the sand. You know how people do that. But the water came in and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. So he writes it again, but the waves covered over it again. Now we get to hear the woman talking to the speaker. Notice the quotation marks telling us that. Vain man, said she, that dust in vain assay, a mortal thing so to immortalize. She's saying that he's being arrogant to think he can make her name last forever on the beach. She continues, For I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. In this section, you probably just threw your hands up over words like eek, but hey, look at these two lines. I myself shall like this decay. She's saying like the writing on the beach, she's also going to decay or die. Her name will also be wiped out. She's kind of morbid, right? The next line goes, not so, quote I. You've got to read the punctuation here. Quote I is in parentheses. I know, I know you've never used the word quote before, but you know what it's trying to tell us here because it's close to another word you said. You know, I mean. What is he telling us? He's telling us that he's now speaking dialogue to her. Not so, quote I. Let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. Base things are lowly things. So he's like, woman, that's not true. Lower things will die with the dust. And notice that dust is death reference again. But you'll live forever in fame. And he continues, my verse, your virtue shall, rare shall eternize. And in the heavens write your glorious name. Remember Petrarch's sonnet where he talks about his poems being songs? Well, what is a verse? Think of it like a song verse, okay? His poetry will eternize, make her virtues eternal. Okay, make her virtues eternal, if you couldn't hear that. His poems will write her name in the heavens. Where when as death shall all the world subdue, that kind of means like quiet, our love shall live and later life renew. They'll live on in his poetry. Get it? Okay, take a look at that turn there. It's not a super different last two lines, but it still kind of gives you that summary of the whole poem. And here's a great trick for you. I'd write this down. If you're ever reading a Shakespearean or Spencerian sonnet and are asked what the theme is, look at the turn. The last two lines often tell you. Okay, I always actually read into this poem a little bit, and I love how I read into it, because she's making fun of him. She's saying he can never make her name last. And he's like, please, my poems are going to live forever. They're going to make you live forever. And his poems did, 500 years later, and we're still reading about that woman. But I kind of hope he did this on purpose, okay? He didn't write her name in the poem. So we'll forever know about him and his love, but she doubted him, so we'll never know her name. Never doubt a poet.